Well, all right, here we go. We're in letter to an apostle again, reviewing that. Uh, <clears throat> is written by Paul A. Douglas. And we are going to be on the chapter that involves Joseph Smith's prophecies, the one that ones that may not have come true, according to what Paul's going to present to us. So let's look at it here. All right, I got... How can we reconcile Joseph Smith's numerous false prophecies with the test of a true prophet as found in Deuteronomy chapter 18? Apparently, Paul, again, is sharing with us his belief that there's some truth to the Bible. We may disagree on that, but uh, let's see what he's got to say. So he's going to quote Deuteronomy here, trust of, tr <clears throat> the, uh, which basically says... If it doesn't happen, if, if, if the prediction of the prophet doesn't come to pass, then he ain't no prophet. Okay? Does that guy look like Dieter? Kind of does, doesn't he? All right. Ah, I'm serious. Um, it does look like Dieter. It's a handsome wolf. Come on. All right, so Joseph Smith claims to have been speaking for God in these eight instances, according to Paul here, that he feels that Joseph Smith's prophecies didn't work out too well. Some of the things that it says, in the following failed false prophecies were indisputably given by Joseph Smith. They're recorded in the history of the church and the doctrine and covenants. Are they all in both of those, Paul, or are they... All of them are at least one of them. He didn't quite make that clear enough for me to understand. Smith's wording clearly states that he spoke in the name of the Lord. Yeah, Joseph Smith was pretty good at saying he was speaking for the Lord, that's for sure. Okay, so he said things like, In the name of the Lord, verily thus saith the Lord, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel. That's about as official as we get, isn't it? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of Jesus Christ, behold, I am God. I have spoken it. Yea, the word of the Lord. And according to Paul, none of the prophecies here came to fruition. All right, well, did time run out on all of them, Paul? I guess we'll take a peek here. Okay, the coming of the Lord. So Joseph Smith says that, ah, Joseph Smith then stated and that the meeting had been called because God had commanded it, and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. He got the double whammy there, huh? Dot, dot, dot. It was the will of God that they should be ordained to the ministry and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time, for the coming of the Lord, which was nigh. Even fifty-six years should wind up the scene. Okay. How about that? Sounds like he kind of left out some parts that weren't considered that important, but those were the main things he wanted to wanted to bring out in that. 56 years should wind up the scene, so between 1835 when that was uttered and 1891, it didn't happen. Unless we're calling when Lorenzo ran into Jesus taking a walk on the temple, the second coming. Okay. All right. And Oliver recounted... The prophecy sp was spoken by Joseph Smith in 1835 and recorded by Oliver Cowdery. Okay. David W. Patton to go on a mission, the revelation says. Verily thus saith the Lord, it is wisdom in my servant, it is wisdom in my servant David W. Patton that he settle up all his business as soon as he possibly can and make a disposition of his merchandise that he may perform a mission unto me next spring, in company with others, even twelve, including himself, to testify of my name and bear glad tidings unto the world. This prophecy was made on April 7th, 1838. David Patton died in October of 1838, and so he never served a mission, says Paul. Well, maybe Jesus doesn't know everything. He just said he knows everything. So, um, I suppose you could, <clears throat> you could decide that David did something wrong. 
Hey, what's wrong with being a Danite? Being a Danite leader, not the leader of the Danites, but the leader of a mission. He was a he was an apostle, I believe, and he was in charge of. Uh, I think he was pretty much in charge. He was a leader of the group that was basically a Danite terrorist group. <laughs> and they got into a little trouble with uh, the militia in Missouri. They got in a shootout, had a little battle. We'll make it sound noble. It was the Mormon War, maybe, right? Well, anyway, Danites uh, got into a, a skirmish. People were killed. David Patton was one of the leaders of that attack, I believe, and he was killed. So, um, you figure it out. We heard the Lord worketh not in secret combinations. The Danites were definitely a secret combination, organized after the manner of illuminated Freemasonry, and they had death oaths sworn to do the will of the First Presidency of the Church, not excluding murder or treason, according to what I've read. So, um, anyway, David didn't go on his mission. The United States government to be overthrown in a few years. So we got a relative term. You have to decide what a few word years means, I suppose. He says, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God of Israel, unless... The United States redress the wrongs committed upon the saints in the state of Missouri and punish the crimes committed by her officers that in a few years the government will be utterly overthrown and wasted and there will not be so much as a pot's herd left for their wickedness in permitting the murder of men, women, and children, and the wholesale plunder and extermination of thousands of her citizens to go unpunished. Joseph Smith, according to Paul, made this prophecy. Um, what just happened? <clears throat> okay. Not quite sure how that happened. I wasn't even touching it. Joseph Smith made this prophecy. I think it said on May 6th as we get back to it. What in the world is going on? So I'm using different software because I had too much. I'd, I've had two files blown that were like 45 minutes long. And so I just decided to use AZ instead of Mobazan. Joseph Smith made this prophecy May 6th, 1843. There was no redress in the United States by all accounts, well, by Paul's accounts anyway, uh, still stands. Well, you know, according to Fox News, they're still around anyway. Um, if you understand what corporate governance is, you might differ as to what actually is the method of ruling the people here. It has been more than 150 years since this vengeful prophecy and our great country and its government still stand. All right, Paul. That's what Paul has to say. The great government of the United States. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, this thing's acting weird on me. I don't know if that's... Okay, so um, they do still have Congress, but maybe the women coming out and saying that they're all... They're all uh, <clears throat> promiscuous, wicked men will bring down the government here shortly. Who knows? Or maybe rocket man will wipe us out. Congress to be broken up as a government. While discussing the petition to Congress, I prophesied by virtue of the holy priesthood vested in me and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if Congress will not hear our petition and grant us protection, they shall be broken up as a government, and God shall damn them, and there shall be nothing left of them, not even a grease spot. Not even a grease spot. Okay. Well... Do we have time limits on that? They've been a little bit a little bit blurry on when that would happen. 
Patience, Paul. A little while, a few years is <clears throat> something that I'm sure Bruce McConkie could make stretch into whatever it needs to be. Finding treasure in Salem, Massachusetts. I, the Lord your God, am not displeased with your coming this journey. With your coming this journey. I can't speak English, but I can rule the universe. This journey, notwithstanding your follies, I have much treasure in this city for you. For the benefit of Zion. And many people in this city. Okay, so the treasure doesn't sound like it's people, since he names that specifically in addition. Whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion through your instrumentality. Therefore, it is expedient that you should form an acquaintance with the men in this city as you shall be led, and it shall be given you. And it shall come to pass in due time that I will give this city into your hands, that you shall have power over it. Power over the city. How about that? Insomuch that they shall not discover your secret parts. No comment. And its wealth pertaining to gold and silver shall be yours. Sounds pretty explicit. Concern not yourselves about your debts. For I will give you power to pay them. <laughs> Why did they just go to the treasure cave in the Hill Cumora that Brigham and Oliver like to talk about and just trash a few golden Nephite records and, you know, melt them down and get rich? Anyway, they don't like to talk about that this, these days. So, um, Salem, Massachusetts, the town of the witches. Uh, maybe the church bought stock in uh, Parker Brothers and makes lots of money from that uh, from the sale of the Ouija boards that they manufacture there in Salem, Massachusetts, if they still do. Um, maybe they make them in Salem, Oregon, too. Who knows? Yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe they're getting lots of money out of Salem and we just don't know about it. Otherwise, it looks a little shaky there, doesn't it? <clears throat> Did they get a lot of converts out of the town of the witches? Interesting choice for Joseph to go to. But, you know, the Lord was guiding them, right? All nations would be involved in the American Civil War. I don't think so, Paul. Verily thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations, beginning at this place. That says nothing about it all being part of the Civil War, however, when the other nations get involved. It says that the beginning of these wars will be beginning at this place. I've read this many times. For behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern states, and the southern states will call upon other nations, even upon the nation of Great Britain, which I believe did come to pass. And it, and it as it is called, and they shall call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations, which they have done. And then war shall be poured out upon all nations. Well, so far we've had the first two world wars, just as Albert Pike, 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, at least 10th degree York Rite Freemason, and all sorts of other accolades within Freemasonry, and communed with uh, Giuseppe Manzini, Form the Mafia, other Illuminists, and wrote about World War I, World War II, and World War III, made descriptions and goals for all of them. So far, he's done pretty well in his predictions, and these countries were drawn, many countries were drawn into those wars, and the war with Islam, between Islam and Christianity, which Albert Pike said was part three of the plan in those wars to bring about the new order of the ages through Freemasonry and the Illuminati, which Albert Pike wrote about, 
um, seems to be going pretty close to what he's said. I've read what he said. <coughs> so Fair Mormon responds, and oddly enough, I'm going to have to agree with Fair Mormon for once. They say, following the Civil War, many nations entered into alliances and secret agreements in order to protect themselves from other nations and uh, secret agreements. It seems like it repeated itself, or Paul repeated it or something. And these alliances were made until nearly every nation on earth has taken sides, had taken sides with the Triple Alliance there. It was during the period of the World War, 1914 to 1918, called World War One. normally, Great Britain made her appeal to the nations, other nations, to cover the defense of the standard of democracy. Democracy. What a joke. Her pleadings were heard round the world. And what is more remarkable, the entire procedure conforms exactly to the prediction made by Joseph Smith, according to fair Mormon guys, saying they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations. A plurality of nations aligned and allied on, uh, uh, ally, allied on both sides of this deadly conflict. It says, they go on to say, this revelation was not just about the Civil War. The revelation makes that very clear by stating in verse 1, Thus saith the Lord concerning the wars, plural, that will shortly come to pass. Notice that the word used is wars, plural, not war. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole thing there, but um, yeah. I think Fair Mormon guys pretty much got it right. That's the way I've always seen it, too. It's pretty clear. Um, it, it does not say that all nations would be involved with the Civil War. It just doesn't say that. I mean, it's, it's right there. Okay. Um, hail, pestilence, famine, and earthquake to destroy the wicked. All right, so we've got another revelation here. And now I am prepared to say by the authority of Jesus Christ that not many years shall pass away before the United States shall present such a scene of bloodshed as has not a parallel in the history of our nation. Pestilence, hail, famine, and earthquake will sweep the wicked of this generation from off the face of the land. Well, we had 600,000 guys die in the Civil War. I kind of doubt that they just happen to be all the most wicked people in the, in the nation, however, myself. To open up and prepare the famine, excuse me, the, the way for the return of the lost tribes of Israel from the north country. The people of the Lord, those who have complied with the requirements of the new covenant, have already commenced gathering together in Zion which is the state of Missouri. Zion is the state of Missouri. Oh, Joe, you're putting yourself in a corner here badly this time. Therefore, I declare unto you the warning which the Lord has commanded to declare unto this generation, remembering that the eyes of my Maker are upon me, and that to him I am accountable for every word. I say, wishing nothing worse to my fellow man than eternal salvation. Therefore, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Repent ye, repent ye, and embrace the everlasting covenant, and flee to Zion before the overflowing scourge overtake you. For there are those now living upon the earth whose eyes shall not be closed in death until they see all. All these things which I have spoken fulfilled. Well, Joseph Smith, this was long before they had Zango, you know, so uh, I don't know how these people were going to live that long. But uh, maybe these were people in Middle Earth or something, huh? But it says on the Earth. Where do people live on the Earth? In Hunza! Oh, but they only get to be about 140. Close, but no matter when a cigarette. Yeah, um, that one doesn't look too good. 
That one doesn't look too good at all for Joseph Smith. That one's looking really rough. You know, Wilfred Woodruff said pretty much the same thing too in general conference. Said there's people here at this conference that won't die before the Lord comes, and that's been an awfully long time. I was getting anxious about that in the 80s. Yeah. So, uh, don't know anybody that's that old. Temple to be built in Zion in Missouri. I see this one quoted by people all the time. I mean, I don't know if they quote the whole thing, but the temple did not get built in Missouri in Joseph Smith's generation. Let's just skip down here near the bottom. Until a house shall be built unto the Lord, and a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. Now, for verily this generation shall not pass away until a house shall be built up unto the Lord. Yeah, okay. So anyway, um, yeah, he says uh, that Zion's going to be built, which is the new Jerusalem. Um beginning at the temple lot which is appointed by the finger of the lord in the western boundaries of the state of missouri and dedicated by the hand of joseph smith jr and others with whom the lord was well pleased verily this is the word of the lord that the city new jerusalem shall be built by the gathering of the saints beginning at this place even the place of the temple which temple shall be reared in this generation for verily this generation shall not pass away until a house shall be built unto the Lord and a cloud rest upon it. Well, I haven't seen the cloud resting upon it, and it's not in Missouri last I checked. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's a pretty tough one. Because since everybody got kicked out of Missouri, the temple lot legal case... You know, doesn't the reorganized church own it, you know? Maybe they needed money and sold it recently. Who knows? The Temple Lot case is so interesting. See, like, the Joseph F. Smith. Oh, sure, yeah, I'm the president of the Southern Pacific Union Pacific Railway or the whatever, ZCMI and about a hundred other things. Oh, I didn't know I owned Deseret. Oh, I didn't know I was the chairman of this and that and the other. Well, that's for another time. How does anyone have a time to be a prophet when you're you know, the <clears throat> director of or president of so many, many large companies? Selling the copyright to the Book of Mormon. So, it's interesting, says Paul, to note that Joseph Smith's revelation below about selling the copyright to the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> had it been true... Is that what he's saying? Had Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Knight, Hiram Page, and Josiah Stoll been successful in their journey to Kingston, Ontario, Canada in 1830 to do so, then maybe we wouldn't have these 3,913 changes to it. I've, uh, I, I've wondered at times if that copyright was only for a particular geographical geographic area. Can you do that? Can you just have it a, co a copyright for just, you know, the Book of Mormon for Canada? I don't know. I don't think I've ever heard of any book that actually has that happen. So they're just going to sell the copyrights for the keystone of our religion, as Joseph Smith and others have called it, the Book of Mormon. Yeah, so someone else could make other changes in it. Maybe they did sell it to somebody. No, don't think so. Spencer Kimball got the uh, White and delights him take, taken out of it to stop embarrassing him since he kept bragging how the Indians were turning white when they came into his Indian placement program. And then when he was the prophet, the scripture changed and the prophecy went away because not enough Indians were turning white enough for people to believe him anymore, I guess. <clears throat> okay. So anyway, as we know, that they failed to sell it, even though Joseph Smith prophesied that they would. So they come back, and what's he say? Some pro some revelations come from God, some from man, some from the devil. I guess my seer stone might have been malfunctioning. It's something he could have said afterwards, but we don't have that part recorded. When Joseph Smith wrote the bulk of this Joseph Smith translation of the King James Bible in 1833, he changed the proper age for circumcision 
to be performed, says Paul. Sorry, Paul, that's not the case at all. Um, that I can certainly see. So let's look at what you have to say. My dear friends, I think that the above examples of Joseph Smith's failed prophecies should give you pause. But they all pale compared to the following. Says Paul, when Joseph Smith wrote the bulk of his Joseph Smith translation of the King James Bible around 1833, he changed the proper age for circumcision to be performed from eight days to eight years. Citing here, Joseph Smith translates in Genesis 17.11. All right, Paul goes on to say, no big deal. Yes, it's a very big deal. And this alone has driven honest, thoughtful Latter-day Saints from the Mormon church. I don't know any of them. Think about it. God spoke to Abraham and covenanted that Abraham's seed would be his people and would be he would be their God and that the token for this holy covenant was circumcision at eight days as recorded in Genesis chapter 17 verse 10. Saying, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and thee, me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall be circumcised. Ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. Sorry for people that are not wanting to hear this. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. All right. That's how you know if you've got a runaway slave, you make them show you if they were circumcised, huh? Pretty disgusting. But in 1833, according to Paul, with the stroke of his quill pen, Joseph Smith changes it from eight days to eight years. The importance and consequence of this is that one word is earth-shattering. This means not just did Abraham get it wrong, but so did David and Daniel and Isaiah and tens of millions of Jews. They were all circumcised too late. And most significant to all, the Lord Jesus Christ, who Paul apparently believes is a real person. We're all circumcised at eight days, according to the covenant. According to Joseph Smith, none of them were right. God allowed all his Old Testament prophets and his own son to err, to err, only to show the truth to the Latter-day Prophet thousands of years later. So, once again, Paul's telling us that Joseph Smith changed the age for circumcision from being eight days old to eight years old. And he cites the Joseph Smith translation, Genesis chapter 17, verse 11. So we shall look at it. File manager. Download. Inspired version of the Bible. Inspired version, the Holy Scriptures containing the Old and New Testaments, and inspired revision of the authorized version by Joseph Smith, Jr. Genesis chapter 1. Okay. Hmm. Moving right along here. Getting close. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 17. Which says, And when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I, the Lord, I, God, I, the Almighty God, give unto thee a commandment that thou shalt walk uprightly before me and be perfect. Okay. Then I'll make a covenant between me and thee, and I'll multiply thee exceedingly. And it came to pass that Abram fell on his face, called on the name of the Lord, and God talked to them, saying, 
My people have gone astray from my precepts, and have not kept mine ordinances, which I gave unto their fathers. And they have not observed mine anointing, and the burial or baptism wherewith I commanded them. Maybe because it's not in the Bible anywhere, it's only where Joseph Smith puts it in. And if we think that the great and abominable church took that out, since it says in 1 Nephi chapter 13, that the uh, book of the Lamb was in good shape until the Catholics got a hold of it, until the great and abominable church, the devil got a hold of it after it went forth from the apostles of the Lamb. Well, they didn't get the copies that the Jews had of the uh, Old Testament books of Moses, guys, and guess what? You're not going to find baptism in there. Sorry. But Joseph Smith's going to put it in here now anyway. He's telling us once again like he did in early chapters of this that uh, Adam got baptized and so forth. So he's uh, trying to throw baptism into the Old Testament here when it actually was never in there. All right. But they've turned from the command my, from the commandment and taken unto them this, the washing of children and the blood of sprinkling. Well, we did have blood of sprinkling supposedly in the law of Moses a little later. And have said that the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins and have not known wherein with they are accountable before me. But as for thee, behold, I will make my covenant with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. And this covenant I will make that thy children may be known among all nations. Because everybody's going to be just like saying, hey, check me out. I'm a Hebrew. I'm immodest. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. What are they going to like? Uh, I don't want to think about this. Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations I have made thee. So this is when he becomes Abraham, when he's 99, which means it's anachronistic for Jehovah, whoever that is, to call him Abraham. Abraham, when he comes down to save him in the book of Abraham, long before he went to Egypt and any of this was supposed to happen, even though Joseph Smith translates this and says, this is when he became Abraham. He contradicts his own book of Abraham on that by many years. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come of thee and of thy seed. And I will establish a covenant of circumcision with thee, and it shall be my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, that thou mayest know forever that children are not accountable before me until they're eight years old. Children are not accountable before me. It says nothing about circumcising them at eight years old there. Okay, then we, if we skip ahead here, what we find is, Verse 16 says, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and, and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in thy house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. <clears throat> that he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So there we have it. It is eight years old when you are accountable for your sins, but it is eight days old when you are circumcised, according to the Joseph Smith translation. Um, so maybe you ought to correct that one there, Paul, because uh, it doesn't say what you said it said. Maybe you got a little confused there. It's pretty clear. It says circumcise eight days old. Accountability eight years old. So, you know, I guess there's supposed to be a, <clears throat> a lesson in that for us to remember. Um, but it doesn't say to circumcise people when they're eight years old there so you got that one wrong pal sorry about that um all right so here's fair mormon's uh, comments on joseph's prophecies so um you can read that if you want to i'm not going to do it we already looked at some of it on the i had to agree with what i saw from fair mormon on the uh 
the Civil War business, uh, obviously, it did not say that all nations would be involved with the Civil War. It said that was a starting point for wars that would shortly come to pass. So, um, there's the review, folks. Um, definitely, Joseph Smith did paint himself into a corner on some of these. It doesn't look good on a few of them. That's definitely for sure. Haven't seen that temple come up in Missouri. No. David Patton definitely didn't go on a mission unless he went to the spirit world after he was killed in a terrorist operation, essentially. You can categorize it as you want. All right. Um, Going to wind this one up. Dodger game out. If I can figure out how to turn off this thing. <laughs>